This is In Bootcamp, episode 23, Computer Science, on Saturday, June 22nd, 2019, with your hosts, Matthew Petchel and Ryan Rambersad. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash IV23. Hey. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. How about you? Good. Another gorgeous week here in Minnesota. Yes, that's for sure. It's been pretty nice out. Boot camp is winding down. Our class periods are getting shorter and shorter. The professors are letting us out earlier and earlier. And it just feels like it's all coming to an end. Yeah, it certainly does seem that way when you have your group project three and you have some non-technical or, you know, like non-hands-on coding projects uh, or topics to cover. Like, uh, for example, computer science. Yeah, well, we still have little coding exercises to do. Um... So today we were talking about uh, sorting algorithms a lot. And for, I mean, we talked about quite a few of them, but for selection sort, uh, insert sort, and quick sort, we actually had to make a JavaScript version. Uh, we weren't allowed to just do, you know, erase that sort. Well, that seems fair. Which would have been nice, and we would have gone home earlier. <laughs> yeah, but that wouldn't teach you anything. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, but at the end of last class period we did talk a little bit about uh, just doing linear searches and just going through each element of an array and just shifting it over if it is and it and how it's bad and so, and so we started up today um basically we did um selection sort first and the professor had sheets of paper that were printed off and everyone had a number and then you were like Okay, I need nine of you to volunteer. Okay, you, 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 and he volunteered nine people. Um, and they had to go to the front of the class, and then we had to go through it one by one and how it worked. Like, with cool. each of the different... Yeah. Well, at first, I did, was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. But it actually was kind of cool when we got to Quicksort. And so tell me why Quicksort is cool. Okay, so he had nine people, then he had two other people come up, and then he had one person hold an I and another person hold a J and stuff, and then he was like, okay, you with the number, you are now a pivot, and then so he stepped forward, and then the person with the I went over to the left of them, and it was supposed to be like showing that the I loop iterated to that side, and then the J loop iterated over to that side, and to each side of the pivot, uh, looking for values that were greater or less than itself. It's, it's, it's really fun to do some of those in-person, physical, hands-on examples for sorting, uh, and and for other computer science topics, because it's not easy for people who have never seen algorithms broken out like this to conceptualize what that means. What well, is? I still don't always get it. So we saw the animation of how uh, quick sort works and stuff. I don't know how it breaks up into so many pivots like that. Because what the animation I saw was like exactly four pivots, and each pivot was, you know, exactly one quarter of the way through and stuff. And according to the Wikipedia article I read, some of the pivots are just done by random. Yeah, I, I don't <clears throat> recall the exact reasoning for the random property in Quicksort. Uh, but when I was in computer science in the uh, U of M algorithms course, uh, we also had a few different variants, and one of the variants we coded was the random and simply midway through the array version. And I suppose if you're trying to make a little animation for something, you're going to pick the best case scenario that you're going to pick. Yeah, cause... for sure. Uh, one thing I would say is if you're ever writing an algorithm and the algorithm is supposed to be deterministic, which is to say that given the same input, you get the same output. You should not use random as a property of your algorithm. Oh, really? That's kind of a that's kind of a bad thing to do. Uh, try to make try to make your algorithms deterministic if at all possible. And so I I uh, heard that you also did sort of a an overview on Big O notation, or at <gasps> least almost did. Okay, he made us aware that it existed in the world and how yeah, that's, what, that's what overview means, right? Well, yeah. Uh, couldn't tell you much about it, but basically we talked about how, um, like on some quick sorts, even if it's already sorted and you're just checking over an already sorted thing, it still sucks. And, um, insert sort would be a much better way to go over it and how there's best cases and worst cases. And sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes quick sort is faster. Sometimes it's a lot slower. I mean, that's why when you benchmark something, some, that's why you do it so many times sometimes to get the average. 
Yeah, so there's another sorting algorithm that isn't listed here in our show notes, but that's very common for people to learn about, which is merge sort, where you kind of divide and conquer your uh, array or set of data. And there's a further another sorting method called tim sort. And one of the properties of tim sort is that at some language specified threshold, it will switch from insert sort to merge sort. And the reason it does this is because insert is pretty okay on smaller ranges of content, whereas merge sort is bigger on bigger ranges of content. So after we went over this, a few things, um, he had his TA slack out a blog post about going over uh, 12 different sorting algorithms in JavaScript. And he said that these are incredibly common to see on interview questions and on little coding exercises at interviews. Um, and he just said that before you guys actually go out in the world and stuff, you really should look over this blog post and really understand because they like to trick people up with this. Yeah, I find that kind of practice quite uh, quite bad in the industry. So where, where when I do interviews and where, where I'm from in the industry, we tend to avoid these kinds of Kind of, they're not abstract and they're not meaningless, but they're not practical. They don't represent traditional work in the current industry that you're looking to go into. So why ask about them? So the reason to ask about them is, well, you know, given enough time, a reasonable and intelligent person should be able to figure out how this thing works and why it's good or why it's bad. Fine, I agree. But when you're doing an interview, do you have a lot of time? No. Are you super smart during an interview? No, you're nervous. And do you really want to talk about algorithms? Or would you prefer to talk about accomplishments and interesting topics that are novel? People have been doing these sorts for thousands of years. Okay, that's not true. Uh, at least epoch time. Before, way before epoch time. Instead of talking about stuff that's kind of boring and sort of rote at this point... I think it's better to talk about something that's interesting and novel and new and specific to the person who's in that interview. Well, I do have one last question for you before we move on. In your time as an actual developer in the real world, has the default, like, you know how JavaScript just comes with a sorting function? Has that nope. ever not been good enough for you? Have you ever actually had to go in and make your own? Or has it always just been good enough to just, you know, erase.sort? Yes and no. Typically, when I have data that I need sorted, it's coming from a database of some sort. When I have that kind of data in a database that I need sorted, I'll ask the database to do that sorting, if at all possible. Sometimes we'll have data that needs to be sorted, and it has less than a thousand, you know, entries in its array. At that point, I'm usually not too concerned with the speed of the sort. I'm concerned with, is it working right? Uh, usually when we're doing sorting um, for business purposes, we're not sorting on a, an array of numbers, as you were here. We're sorting on objects with a dozen properties. Now, imagine there are business rules in that sort, so it's not sorting like in order, it's sorting according to rules, which may or may not be in you know ordered rule set, so it's a little bit more advanced and a little bit more complicated. At the end of all of that, what that means is the, the typical sort algorithm in javascript or in java or wherever it's probably good enough to do everything in memory at a thousand units long especially when you start adding all this business logic up on top and if anybody asks you should you know how to code an arbitrary sort algorithm the answer is no i will google it three i'll read wikipedia and four uh i missed two because i didn't sort the array very nice so one other thing we kind of briefly touched on, um, we had this little table of, you know, time and space complexity and stuff. And when we started talking a little bit more about Big O, we brought up the graph and it, he made it sound like it's something you really got to think about when you pick your sorting algorithms. Like... Is that actually something? Because everything, when we did our little benchmarks in one of our exercises and stuff, there were like a thousandth of a second difference between them. And like sometimes they were different. Like, does it actually matter that much in the real world? So again, yes and no. So if you're doing something that has a constrained input size, it probably doesn't matter, to be honest. If you have a hundred elements, a thousand elements, pretty much any language and any modern CPU, whether it be on a phone or in a server 
or on a desktop computer, it should be fine and capable of handling that, regardless of how how big or complex your set of rules are for your sort. Thousand elements is no big deal. But when you have two million elements to sort, what do you do? Well, merge sort, for example, makes copies of those arrays. Like you're taking one array and you're making two more subunit arrays out of that. Now you have twice as much memory being used, basically. So it's not always a good idea to waste so much memory when you're doing that because you could quickly run out of literal memory when you start making copies of a two million unit array. That's pretty big. So there are situations where in-place sorts uh, can be useful, and there are situations where maybe it's uh, a sorting algorithm that's slower, but it doesn't use as much memory, so it could be more useful on something like a Raspberry Pi or an embedded system like an Arduino. Okay. Well, that gives me more things to think about. Not all of these things, and you asked earlier, so not all of these things are things you should know about on day one in terms of the answer. What you should know on day one is that there are reasons for these things. You don't need to know the situation to use something or something else. You don't need to have a perfect understanding of the pros and cons. You should have an overview and general knowledge of what sort of algorithms can do and what they can't do. You should have a general idea of how fast or slow they are and how much memory or space they may take up. Beyond that, it's a bonus, in my opinion. Another week went by, and we spent a little bit more time with our group's project. And as we know from last week, I bought a .us domain. And I mentioned it, that I did not have it set to private registry, because you can't. And I had to do that. And like a fool, I included my personal cell phone on the registry, which has since been changed. Um, but like two days after that, I started getting texts and calls at like 4 a.m. and then all hours of the day asking me to hire them for web development stuff. And I had a deal that's about to expire from GoDaddy for five more years of hosting. Never used GoDaddy, never did any of that. It's just I started getting so, so much spam. Yep, that's what you get when you buy a U.S. domain name Yeah, so in America. I kind of felt like I got screwed. And I told all my group members, and they didn't seem to get it. Yeah. yeah, they probably don't understand the process of even buying a domain at this point. Yeah. So tell me how the actual project is going. So, like, has code been written? Are there is there a database set up? Is there an API? Like, what's going on with this? We're, we're still discussing on who's going to do what. And it's pretty late Pretty late in the process to be doing no, no, that. No, no, no. There's still plenty of time. This project is not due to July 11th, and this is June 22nd. So we still got like three whole weeks to do this. That's like no time whatsoever. That's plenty of time. Uh, but basically, we had a group meeting after this. Um, so everything I've been doing up until now has kind of been like a little, what what's feasible? What can we do? Because... Um, I know how to deploy to a website, but I wanted to do something that's automatic. Like we, we hinted at using Travis before and how we could use it to check and verify code with linting rules before we allowed it in the master branch. And we've got all the little things, but I wanted a completely automated deployment system. And you've been, you were helping with that this week and stuff. Um, and I kind of want to get that all kind of set up and stuff just to know what's possible going forward. And it's been just trying to figure out what's out there, and now we finally decided what we're going to do. I am going to be a front-end person. I've been working on making React components for um, all the different parts of the website. Um, Amanda will also be on the front-end, and she will be doing styling and backgrounds and font colorings and stuff. Um, the other two group members are going to be completely back-end, and that means they do all functionality, right? I believe that is the definition of backend. Yeah. So one of the things that I would say, like you've you've kind of uh, divvied up your work, which is great. But one of the things that I would say to that is it's kind of a bummer that you're not doing a little bit of all slices of types of work. Everybody should contribute to a, a table design. Everybody should contribute to the SQLized implementation. Everybody should write one of the endpoints. 
when everybody should write a React component. Everybody should do everything. I kind of have a feeling that by the end of it, I will have my um, code and everything. Uh, I don't th think it's going to get done if I don't. Uh, just, just my gut feeling. Um, that seems fair, considering the previous two group projects. Yeah. Um, but I'll worry about that a little bit later on. Uh, but basically, we did it how we've always done it. We started our little meeting like, well, what do we do this week? And I told them what I got done. And then they all said nothing. Um, and then we decided, like, what do we want to have done by the next time we meet? And I was going to have basic bootstrap all of our stuff together. Uh, there is bootstrap for React now. Yes, that's React strap. Yes. And that is what we're going to be using for that. And then we're going to have great. some custom styling on top. For sure. It will greatly simplify some of the component creation. And then you don't even have to pull in jQuery, which is always a bonus. Yeah. And that's pretty much where we are right now in our group project. That's excellent. Uh, earlier this week, as you mentioned, I was helping you uh, set up your Circle CI deployment system. And we had to go through some uh, adventures. Uh, I've never used Circle. I've heard people use it, but I've never used it myself. So we had to learn it pretty quick. And uh, we had to also figure out how your server is set up, which is not the typical secured setup. It's the insecure setup, which means it's different from everything that I've ever used. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're pretty close to being able to deploy automatically to the server. We just need to do a little bit more work on that, and then we'll be good. It was kind of fun to watch you and your workflow, and because... I would have been stuck with the guides and this the way you could scan a guide and then take what you need from it and then completely make up the rest and it just magically works is amazing. You know, and for the last, uh, I don't know, six months or so, uh, you've been in your boot camp and you've pointed this out to me on numerous occasions and I've noticed it when I'm at work now helping others, especially the interns. So next week um, is going to be mostly group working activity. Like, we'll have, we're, so we're going to be over the next two and a half weeks. So much of the time in the classroom is actually allocated just to working in groups. And so, does that actually mean you're all going to show up in person and work in a group together? Yes, which is not how I like working. Um, you should get used to that. That's how yeah. people actually work in the real world. Yeah, but it's it's going to end up being all talk about anime or pokemon i'm serious it's going to be one punch man this one punch man that and it's i've worked with these people i mean these are these the group i picked are the people i've been sitting at with a table i built a relationship with all these people over the last six months well you should build a working relationship with them again you, i try to set feasible goals things that actually be achieved oh well that is pretty dismal then yeah yeah Everything is just going to get, because we would do exercise and be like, okay, everyone partner up and then do that. And it was always this one person drive, one person had that, and then one person hovering over the shoulder saying what to do. And then it would always start out that way and then just end with me just doing it pretty much. So in the, besides your group work, what else are you going to be doing? Well, it's in week 23 material, so we can see what's coming up. We have three other languages to go over like we're doing other things we're doing console io in ruby and python and in javascript or <laughs> java javascript and java are the same thing right yes like cars and carpet yes um uh, but no so we're gonna have a little bit of ruby to play with and when we started the course we had a little thing about before the first day of class get sql workbench get vs code get everything um they gave us like they told us we needed mongo they told us everything we need to have installed before class began and ruby was not on there and i was kind of surprised to see that and neither was python so we'll actually yeah. see if it goes if we actually spend time with it or if it's just if you're curious here's some stuff that might be what it is, because I don't think they're going to want to waste anybody's time trying to install Ruby or Python. That seems like a lot of work. Well, I mean, I have Ubuntu. I have both 2 and 3 installed. Yeah, I know, but it's still a lot of work. And uh, there are Ruby and Python web versions that 
could suffice, but it's not very interesting. So I think they might just skip it. Yeah. But who knows? I'll know by the end of next week. Speaking of next week, what else is coming up next week? On Tuesday is Hacker X during one of my class periods. Ah, uh, one of the legendary Hacker X events. Mm, legendary. Um, so one of my classmates is going to ditch with me if I do end up going, which I probably am. And he ends, he works in Minneapolis, so he just has to go south to Bloomington. That uh, sounds like a good plan. So what are some of the things that you're going to do differently this time? I just think that I want to pretty much do the same thing. I've updated my resume and added a few more lies that look good. Um, mm. no, and... Basically, the reason I think this hacker axe is going to be so much better is I think I'm going to be a lot more relaxed. I was pretty worked up beforehand, um, but what I learned from last time was nobody was mean about it. Nobody, because everyone knows everyone's there at different skill levels. Um, if they ha had no intention of hiring me or didn't even want to talk to me, they told me almost right away, like, yeah, we're not looking for you. We're not looking for that. And they were nice about it. Um, and it was just a really friendly, lighthearted, fast paced, moving atmosphere. And it was very relaxing once I got used to that. Yep, for sure. I would also suggest um, going for a little walk beforehand, that there's a nice lake nearby. Feel free to walk around the lake. Um, there's uh, pizza. Make sure you do some eating. Uh, and just, just, just find somebody to talk to and just hang out for a bit, because being nervous about doing an interview is no fun, and it doesn't help anybody. Yeah. That's okay. good. Very good. HackerX is uh, an interesting time for everybody, so hopefully that'll go well. Will you be representing Doherty again? I sure will be. Is Hacker X every three or four months, or is it just happen to happen this close together? You know, I think I think they tend to have three a, a, a year here in Minneapolis, and then there may be other secret private events if businesses want to pay for them. But yeah, no, I'm very excited, and we'll see what happens. Yes, that's good. Well, we'll look forward to next week's update on um, you know what kind of experiences you had with that. And uh, we'll also get to hear all about your uh, group Project 3 progress. I'm excited. I really think we have a good idea. I really think it's a possible idea. And outlook is high. Yes, uh, now execution is what matters. <laughs> That's the tricky part, too. It is. So, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me at MatthewBetchell.com. And you can also find me on the People's tabs of the Nexus.tv slash people. That's right. And of course, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Randomar. And of course, on my website, RyanRamperset.com, which is updated because now is powered by Style Components, which is very fancy. Does it still look the same? Still looks identical, except there are a few changes. That's not what identical means. So yeah, you know, that's how it goes. And of course, you can leave comments for us on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And you can chat with us on any individual episode that you like. And you can support any individual episode that you like by going to patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.